So, Miffy, Fran, thank you for having me here at the centre of the cell. Um, if you haven't been inside the centre of the cell, I encourage you to book your slot to go. Uh, there's many hu hundreds of thousands, I think it's over 200,000, is it, Fran, now, have been inside there, particularly focused on young people and enthusing them in science. And we have pretty good evidence now that some of those then either come and join us here in the medical and dental school or go into science elsewhere. So my talk tonight is about the 100,000 Genomes Project and how did it change healthcare. So this story starts here and um, <clears throat> uh, any prizes for guessing who these people are. So who can you see there? So that, what, that man on the left there, Bill Clinton. On the telly screen is uh, Tony Blair. Uh, the controversial man on the left hand end next to Bill is uh, Craig Venter, and then on the right is Francis Collins, on the other side of Bill Clinton. So you, Craig Venter was very controversial because he set up a company to sequence the whole genome of humans and then patent uh, the content. And as a result of that, Francis Collins with Bill Clinton and Tony Blair decided that the genome was the property of humanity and your genome is your genome. And so they entered a race and uh, the reality is the academics and Craig Venter both won, but Craig didn't get to patent the genome, so we stopped that. Um, that project to sequence the whole human genome, which is all of the things that code for you as an individual, they make you, you, but they also can carry susceptibility to disease. And that costs 3.2 billion. So, when the 100,000 Genomes Project was conceived, if it had been back in 2000, it would have cost $320 trillion and nobody would have done it at all. However, um, what you are yourself today is a billionaire. Now, you probably didn't know that when you walked in here, but you have 3.3 billion letters in your genome. And your genome essentially makes the building blocks for life and it does so and you spend it throughout your life making the proteins that make you work but sadly it can also sometimes trigger disease. So um, if I unravel your DNA from one cell it will stand about this high so it's two meters high um, if you unravel it. So there's a lot in it as you might imagine. So I'm going to focus in on the origin of the 100,000 Genomes Project and uh, I'll give you some clues before we get to the big uh, reveal. Um, you know who these two people are. This is David Cameron on the left with a man who's oven ready. And uh, uh, at this same event, the late Her Majesty the Queen Elizabeth uh, was filmed entering via parachute. So you're beginning to get warmer, I suspect. There she is on the parachute. Uh, this is uh, obviously Rowan Atkinson or Mr. Bean, as he's more usually known. Uh, and what happened was at that uh, London 2012 Olympics, uh, David Cameron on the left assembled a group of scientists from around the world alongside health ministers. And what they said was that the moment was right for a country with free at point care health system like the NHS to do a major sequencing project reading the entirety of your and my genetic code. And then that's how the 100,000 Genomes Project was born. And this is David Cameron announcing it in December 2012. Sorry, it's a terrible photograph. So the origin of this project was not like it normally is in science, where Fran and I might write a grant, which is about 30 or 40 pages long, takes us ages. It's a big emotional investment, and often the outcome's disappointing. Uh, <laughs> but you have to pick yourself up and do it again. There was no grant written for this. And uh, what happened, as uh, my wife is here, would attest is that on a Friday evening at about five o'clock, uh, a lady called Dame Sally Davis, some of you may have heard of her former chief medical officer, phoned me up and she said, Mark, we've got this thing called the 100,000 Genomes Project and uh, we need somebody to lead the science uh, and we've thought of you. Now, if you knew Dame Sally as I know Dame Sally, uh, when you're asked something, you're being instructed that you're going to do it. And uh, what that meant is that I accepted to be the chief scientist of Genomics England. Uh, I did say to her, uh, Sally, I, I don't know how we're going to do the 100,000. She said, don't worry, Mark, nobody knows how to do it, so you'll be fine. Uh, and then she handed me four letters uh, of three sides of A4, 
and she said, this is the blueprint for the project. We've had some expert working groups working on it for a while. Off you go and sort it out. So uh, what did we do to discover how to do this? We traveled the world. And the first thing we found was that actually, uh, if you look at Bill Clinton applauding the first human genome and David Cameron awarding the second, the price of a whole genome sequence had come down. So instead of it being 312 trillion, we're now down for an individual person's genome to below $1,000. So the genome cost, when we started, around 800 pounds sterling to do. And if we drive the price down, which we have further, it's now an affordable test that you could use in healthcare. So um, this was the launch of it um, on the 65th birthday of the NHS in 2013. And this is the project. So the project in numbers. So what happened was that when he gathered people together at the Olympic Park, he said, well, uh, you say we should do whole genome sequencing. How, how many should we do? Would 1,000 be enough? I, no, we've already done that. Uh, would 10,000 be enough? No, we're doing that right now. What about 100,000? And <coughs> one of the scientists there said that it will probably only cost about 1,000 pounds a genome, so you need 100 million pounds. And that's how we got the money. Uh, it was as simple as that. So the 100,000 Genomes Project, when incepted, was, uh, we were asked to focus on things that would be a benefit to healthcare. And um, this it, it means rare inherited diseases where there's a major change in the DNA that causes severe disease. They often present early in life. And I'll show you some examples of that. Um, and then we were asked to also look at cancer because cancer, the actual tumor itself, is a disease of disordered genomes. So the, the genome in the tumor uh, has lots and lots of changes, and as a result, that can drive the cancer just to continue to grow, enlarge, and spread. And you can also use that knowledge of the genetic makeup to actually work out what treatments in some cancers you should give. Not in all, but in some. And then finally, we were asked to look at infection. We did some infection, and I'll come back to that, but um, mostly it was rare disease and cancer. So about 97,000 people took part. They're patients with cancer or rare disease and their family members in rare disease, and I'll explain why in a moment. That's over 40 petabytes of data. So if you've got a laptop or an iPad, you could probably get a genome onto the iPad or the laptop but it would be very difficult with your computer processing to be able to actually analyze it. So we had to build a big computer center, uh, which we did um, in Corsham in Wiltshire, and that housed all the data um, while we did the 100,000 Genomes Project. It was quite an interesting place, actually, because uh, this wasn't intentional, but it's, it was inside a military base. Uh, and uh, there were soldiers wandering around at, on the edge of it, or Ministry of Defence police, but they had weapons. Um, and this was because it stores all the government safe data. And it had a really, really interesting feature because it's above a nuclear town for where the government can go and hide in a nuclear attack. Uh, it's uh, in Caution, which is between Chippenham and Bath, I think, or around Chippenham. And what it has is a system where it sucks air up through the uh, railway tunnels below it through to cool the computers. So actually, it's quite eco-friendly. Anyway, that's one of the bits of infrastructure that we built. Then we worked with the NHS and actually partnering the National Health Service is very, very important. Some of you here will know it can take from a clinical trial that shows the benefit of a medicine between 9 and 16 years for that medicine to be used in clinical practice. That's too long. If we've got good evidence it should be used, we should be using it sooner. So the goal of this project was to get the NHS to do the project, not build a parallel research team that did the project. And then at the end of it, the NHS said, well, that's all very well, but you didn't do it with us, so we're not adopting it. So we involved them from the outset, and initially they created genomic medicine centers, which gave regional equity of access involving 98 hospitals. And one of the things is that the project was funded for only to work in England. And I felt at that time that was very, very divisive and the wrong thing. So I worked with various funders and we got money for Scotland, Northern Ireland and Wales to be part of the project. At the peak of the program, 5,000 frontline NHS staff, such as those working in the towers over next to me at the Royal London, worked on this program and touched the samples at some point during their week. And that meant that we had built a coalition within the healthcare system of people who, when this finished, did not want it to stop. 
because they'd really invested personally in this and they saw the benefits of it and they wanted to champion its introduction to healthcare. And that was very important. Now, because the whole genome had not been sequenced at scale and uh, there were still many uncertainties, we assembled by open advert a coalition of over 3,000 researchers from 33 countries across the wall, world and we invited them to remotely log on to the data center I mentioned in Corsham and work on the data. And they uh, didn't have to pay anything, but the only thing they did have to do, and this was the payment, is drive up the value of that information for patients. That was the only thing freely available, democratically available to the world. And that's what we should be doing with our health data, where we can and we have permission from patients. So I'm going to focus in on rare inherited diseases. Rare inherited diseases, they're individually, as the name suggests, rare, but uh, there are over 7,000 of them. Uh, so one in 17 people, about 6% of the UK population, that's about 3.5 million people, are living with those diseases today, every day. And every day, there are many people born with these diseases. And so when we started, what you have to do when you're doing something that really no one else has done, is you have to test the way you're gonna do it at scale so you don't make mistakes. So we did what's called a pilot study uh, and we enrolled 2,183 families and they covered a range of different types of rare disease because rare disease can affect all parts of the body and sometimes multiple parts of the body. And what you can see on the right here is the first child to receive a diagnosis in the program, and that's her mum and dad. Now, all three of these were in the program, and the reason for that is because it can be really hard, and I'll show you why it's really hard in a minute, to actually find the one variant in 3.3 billion that's causing this child's problem, if we get the parents involved, it helps us to filter out information that's not relevant because the parents are fine and they have the same change in their DNA, so they're all right. Why this child, we're looking for things that might be influential on her. So I'll take you through a, a journey on her genome. So in her genome, in the 3.3 billion letters, there were 6.4 million changes in her DNA. That's quite a lot. Uh, 677,000 were rare, so these are present at less than 1%, so they're not that common, they're very rare. And then 2,826 changed a protein, 67 were different from a mum and dad, and one was a clear-cut cause of her disorder. So let me just show you her again. So this had profound implications. This change had occurred in con at conception, so what, that's when the sperm and the egg come together and the baby begins to be created. And this child, only had the mutation because it had been occurred at, at conception and not been inherited from mum and dad. So it was just in her. So that told mum and dad something important. They, if they had another child, which they weren't going to, they could very well have an entirely normal child. And, and many parents, and why I'm going to show you some pictures with their permission, is not only because they want you to see them because they're pleased they got an answer, but also because they want to understand you to understand the journey that they go on, often for years, often without finding an answer, and often without a treatment when they do get an answer. And so these two parents have since gone on to uh, attempt to have a child. This lung girl, girl, as a result of the change, we found that the change affected a sugar transporter, which takes sugar from her bloodstream into her brain. Now, between your and my brains and the blood, there's a little barrier and it's to try and stop harmful things getting into the brain. But in this child's case, she couldn't get sugar in. So every time her brain sugar dropped down, she would have a, a, an epileptic fit. In the time we're in this room this evening, she would probably have had one or two seizures, one or two fits. And if, it, if you measured her sugar in the blood, it was entirely normal. So this change in her DNA told us the answer, but it told us something else too. There is a treatment for this disorder, which is to give a high fat diet because inside your and my brains, for you to survive starvation, there is a mechanism where the brain can make sugar from fat. So if we give her a high fat diet, she makes her own sugar in her brain and her seizures have really subsided. And she had also got, because of the seizures, um, some intellectual delay and that has improved. What if we could have found that shortly after birth? Maybe we could have given her the high fat diet earlier and reduced the problems that she had. So that's an example 
where the 100,000 genomes made a diagnosis. And at the end of the program, we were making diagnoses for about 25% of the participants with a rare disease, and 25% of those had immediate clinical utility. So this is the first family. I mentioned that the other one was the first child. This is the first adult to get a diagnosis on the left here. Now, he had um, inherited a kidney disease gene which caused his kidneys to fail. And he did two kidney transplants. That's very unusual. So he did one when he was young and another one when he was a bit older. He had transmitted the defect in his genome, the change in his genome, uh, to his daughter. And she also had this. But because we had modern blood pressure drugs and medicines that we could treat her with, we prevented her kidney failure until very recently. And so she did done very well. They were both petrified that this young lady, now she is about 23, so she's much older, was going to have the same thing. And uh, to cap this story and why they were worried, this man's father, brother and uncle had all died of this disease. So imagine the stress and pressure on you as a family unit of this illness. What we found was the cause of this gentleman's disease. We found his diagnosis. We found the same change in this lady. And then the NHS went on within a few weeks to test this young lady. And she no longer has to go weekly for blood pressure and kidney tests because she doesn't have the change. So this is one of the really important things in modern medicine, which is not necessarily high-powered medicines or things, but reassurance when something is not awry. awry. So this is another child, and I'm showing you this child because I went to do a talk like this, and it was to parents with rare disease. And at the end of the talk, there were some questions. And, and this lady got up and I said, um, my daughter's in the 100,000 Genomes Project. And because this project's challenging to do, often people had to wait a long time for their results. And usually when somebody said they're in the project, the next question is, where are my results? So I was slightly dreading this. And to my real surprise, she went on to describe her daughter here that you see here. And her daughter had been, uh, since almost birth, having multiple seizures every day. She was developing intellectual disability, becoming really locked in so she wouldn't communicate at all. And uh, she was becoming uh, disabled physically. So they were looking at her going into a wheelchair and th this lady thought that the, her daughter was gonna die. And we found the change in her DNA that means if we just give her some simple amino acids you've all eaten to already today, just in a bigger amount, it can treat her disorder and she no longer has seizures at all. She's shown some intellectual improvement. And this is, uh, her mother just wanted to say that in front of everybody. So this is what it means for these people. This is the human element of the story. And I'll show you how long they spend not getting a diagnosis in a moment. This is one story I, I, I need to share with you because occasionally a uh, whole genome can change the diagnosis. So this little boy here, he's called Owen. And you can see his video on the Genomics England website. I'm not going to show it to you tonight. But what you'll see is Owen uh, is age four when he, we made the video. And he can't speak very well. And he's obviously having difficulty processing his mum and dad's questions and giving them the answer. And you can see a little bit of frustration on his face because he, he knows what he wants to say, but he can't get it out. So this child had been diagnosed with quite a serious condition. It's called diamond black fan anemia. It doesn't particularly matter what it is, but it can have early cancer, and the parents were just dreading it. Um, because in the clinical data that were reported, we were told that this child had anemia, developmental delay, which means essentially, intellectually, they're not entirely able to function as they should. And we therefore looked for genes that cause intellectual delay, and we found that he had a change in his thyroid hormone receptor. Now, the thyroid hormone is something that in you and I uh, controls your, your metabolism and how fast you're able to respond to things. And it's sort of an energizing chemical. And he couldn't, with, he had normal levels of his thyroid hormone, but he just couldn't process it because the, the receptor that takes it on is, wasn't working properly. So what we did was, with advice from a major centre in Cambridge, we gave him high dose of thyroid. And when you watch the film, what you'll see is a child that has to walk together with his mum and dad and is very unsteady at the beginning, and by the end he can dance. So this was transformative for him, 
and uh, his parents made that film because they felt so strongly about it. And as a result of him, and this often happens, seven more families were diagnosed because this hadn't been expected uh, and therefore hadn't been looked for. So I'll tell you a couple of other stories, and I'm, I'm sharing these with you to try and bring this to life and what it can do. Now, the first of these is a boy who was born. He was so ill when he was born, he went straight to the neonatal intensive care. And actually, sadly, he died in there at four months of age. He never left hospital. And no testing that was done showed anything. We didn't know what it was. His mum and dad were desperate to have another child. He was there first. And so they asked, could they enroll their son in the 100,000 Genomes Project? And we allowed this because uh, mums and dads need to know uh, what might be the cause so they can plan whether they have another pregnancy or, or not. And, and some people use that information to decide to go ahead and not. So then her mum became unexpectedly pregnant and she phoned us up and said, look, I really don't want to know. Don't tell me. I don't want to know. But at month eight, she got pretty anxious and she said, actually, I really do want to know now and I wonder if you could just tell me. So we had a look in the boy who sadly died genome because we had his DNA and he had a mutation which, or a change in his DNA which makes it difficult for him to take vitamin B12 inside cells. Now, vitamin B12, you've all eaten today, or you will eat it by the end of the day. It's in many foodstuffs. And this lad just couldn't get it inside his cells. So because of case reports, and often with these diseases, is that just that? Case reports, individual cases that have been written in the literature. There was one that had described this problem and had suggested that if you gave very high doses of vitamin B12 weekly instead of every three months, you could make a real difference. And then his, uh, this, his brother was born, and within one week, because the NHS knew where to look, they tested him, and sadly, he was also affected. But because they knew that, they gave him high-dose vitamin B12, and he's had a totally different life. Now, just before we leave this case, um, to emphasize the affordability of this, it cost £80,000 to take care of this child for four months, a genome less than £1,000, Sounds like fairly good value. Let me give you another example. Um, this is a girl who had repeated admissions to ITU uh, with life-threatening infections. On this occasion, chickenpox. She'd had a lot of testing, but nothing had been category proven. And then we found that she had changes in her DNA in her white cells, in the genes that fight infection. And these affect uh, the, lymphocyte, uh, the lymphocyte part of your white cells. And as a result, she wasn't able to fight either bacterial or viral infection properly. So what this did was it prioritized her for a curative bone marrow transplant, which she's received. Uh, her treatment up until she got that curative bone marrow transplant cost the NHS £356,000. The bone marrow transplant's expensive. It costs £70,000. But £70,000, £356,000, I think you begin to see the profound amount of money it costs to take care of people, and what if we could do more of this? So uh, the other thing that's also important is her, her brothers and sisters were then tested, and they didn't have it. So this is a really big result. Now, I'm not going to show you too many technical things, but there'll be a few. But it doesn't matter about the different names at the bottom. These are all different parts of your and my body. What matters is that these people all didn't have a diagnosis, and now on average, 25% of them do as a result of a whole genome. Why is that? It's because a whole genome's a very comprehensive picture of your and my genetic makeup, and it allows you to read bits of the genome that you can't read with other technologies. So it makes a real difference to your diagnostic ability. Let me give you an example of what it's like to be one of these people having experiencing this. So I'm choosing children here. These are children that were entered into the project that were born after 2003. And then everybody in the project, they consented uh, to collect all of their healthcare data. So we have a huge amount of rich data. And we were able to see that these families spent six years at 68 hospital appointments prior to diagnosis. And until they entered the 100,000 Genomes Project, they had no diagnosis. Their unaffected relatives only went to 18 appointments over even longer. So you begin to see these, these people, if you talk to the mums and dads, they're in and out of the hospital uh, in and out the whole time. They might be in the hospital three times a week. So, and also, if you have a child that's really 
um, got major intellectual disability and physical disability, it's like a military operation to move them around. So there's one family I met in the project who lived in the Midlands, but they had actually taken a train to London and stayed in a Premier Inn overnight before coming to an appointment. And they got up at 5 a.m. to get their child ready to go to a 1 p.m. appointment. That's how long it all takes. Sometimes difficult for us, if we're not affected by these things, to appreciate that. Um, after you make a diagnosis, you get much fewer focused clinical uh, episodes. And why is this? It's because the clinician knows what they're dealing with, and all of a sudden it focuses them in on the important bit. So no longer are they trying to do tests because they don't know what the cause is, and they're trying to do something to get this child a diagnosis uh, and so we can focus things. But to look at these children, and there was only uh, about a six or 700 of them, um, they used 183,000 hospital episodes of care. Each child um, uh, uh, spent 15,000 pounds of NHS money, 87 million pounds in aggregate. So their, their siblings, of course, do enter the health system. They have accidents and all sorts of things. So their cost is also not trivial. But because this is all buried in routine healthcare in lots and lots of episodes, you don't see it. So what we've done is collect this data. And again, I make the point that if I have a test that costs less than maybe 600 pounds now or 500 pounds, compared to 15,000 pounds to get a diagnosis and to try and get someone an opportunity to move forward, that, that has got to be worth it. So we didn't include GP costs, so we didn't know what those were. So overall, the summary of our fast past analysis, which we published in a, a big journal called New England uh, about a year ago, 25% got a diagnosis of immediate use in the health system. It changed medication, it changed their surveillance, it changed their eligibility for clinical trials, and it changed their opportunities in future life or their parents' opportunities uh, around uh, reproductive choice. And some of the treatments really that we could find were very, very simple. Now, I'm not going to pretend to this audience that we've found lots of treatments for lots of people. I have deliberately shown you when this can find treatment. The majority of these people still have no treatment. But because we've got their life course permission to follow them up and we're still in touch with them, we can call them back if we find a medicine or a th therapy that might help them to be in the clinical trial. <clears throat> so what we're now trying to do is to complete that loop where research finds the initial finding and feeds it back to the patient. There's no immediate opportunity, but we stimulate industry to produce a therapy maybe or produce it ourselves, and then we can bring them back because we know who they are and where they are. So that's why we follow them up long, lifelong. We also looked at cancer, and there's over 17,339 cancer participants. Uh, now, <clears throat> In cancer, as I said earlier, this is a disease where the genome is very disordered. Uh, the genetic makeup of the tumor is very different, and it contains often quite a number of mutations. And they may drive the tumor, so they may drive its growth uh, or its spread, uh, but they may also predict the therapy. What we found when we started was that the standard approach, which is to take a piece of the tissue or the tissue, the whole tumor, and drop it into a preservative, um, was really damaging to the DNA, and we couldn't read the sequence properly. And so as a result, we re-engineered 400 pathways in the National Health Service across the whole of England so that we could do fresh tissue genomes, which weren't being done before. We had a bit of resistance to that, but we got it done. And the 17,339 are the largest cancer data set in the world with fresh tissue, and it's very different. I won't show you this for technical reasons. But um, I'm going to talk to you about individuals again. So this is like slightly complex, but don't worry about it. The circles are women. Uh, as you might expect, the squares are men. And there's a diagonal line if they are sadly perished already and died. If the uh, circle's shaded as it is there in the middle, that is um, uh, an affected individual. So this lady came to us with breast cancer. And then in her tumor, and then in the DNA she'd inherited from her mum and dad, we found something called a BRCA mutation. Now, BRCA is a, a potential uh, hereditary cause of breast cancer, but she had no family history of cancer at all. So this may have been spontaneous in her. The finding of this result allowed her to be entered in a trial uh, to receive a medicine called a laparib. doesn't matter what it is, but that was the newest drug, and it has proved to be effective in this type of 
situation. And her daughter decided <clears throat> to have predictive testing, and she is also BRCA2 positive, and has entered um, d detailed screening to check whether she's going to get breast cancer. So this provides a family-wide opportunity. And the men in this family, because BRCA2 has occasionally been associated with prostate tumours, uh, can also have screening. So what I'm emphasising here to you is, often something measured in an individual may have broader consequences for that family. Here's an, another man which I'm going to show you, and I'll just explain this because you'll never, probably never have seen some of these things before. Um, <clears throat> and what, what I've got here is a patient who was 42 who had history of HIV and hepatitis B infection, so infectious disease, and he came to the clinic with weight loss and jaundice, and he had a CT scan. So a CT scan is like taking a slice through the body, but with an X-ray. So you're looking from the man's feet up at his liver. So that big gray thing on the left is his liver, and the really dark gray thing, that is colon cancer in his liver. So this is a bad thing. It's, it's, uh, um, it, it means that the tumor has spread. And <clears throat> although they diagnosed that with routine testing, they did some usual tests for ge genetic markers that might change therapy. They didn't find any, and they gave him some cycles of chemotherapy. This enlarged, and he was getting more symptomatic. So he had a whole genome done, and we found that he had a hereditary form of cancer, which is known as Lynch syndrome. Doesn't matter what it is, but he'd inherited something from his mum and dad. And if we'd known about that before, we might have had him in a screening program, and we may have been able to prevent this. Uh, but what this did do for this man is it got him uh, most advanced cancer therapies, which are called immunotherapies. And these can be very effective. And so although, sadly, he's not going to be saved by this, we were able to give him something that made uh, his life longer and better quality. So this is a complex slide, and it's only really here to prompt me. Don't you worry about it. What it says is that there were 3,244 people enrolled in the West Midlands. 25% of, of the people, when we looked at their genome, uh, sorry, were listed to go back to uh, a genomic tumour board, which is a place where we assemble a lot of experts and they have a look at all the x-rays and scans and then they look at the genome. And for, for um, 477, there was an action. And so what were those actions? Well, some people we discovered that their genetic makeup meant they shouldn't have certain medicines or they should have a reduced dose. This is really useful because some people with certain medicines in cancer experience a lot of problems. And then they could have a clinically actioned medicine or, uh, that was licensed or unlicensed. Many got into clinical trials and there were various other benefits. So to emphasize to you that a genome does help in cancer, and I don't think, I think we've just scratched the surface here. Now, this is the technical term, and it's a prompt to me, really, rather than you. This is about where your genome and a medicine interact. Now, uh, it turns out we've looked at 76,000 genomes. 99.5% of you in this room have at least one change in your DNA, which if you come across a medicine, it either won't work or you will get side effects. Now, that's 99.5% of you. So the biggest benefit from genomics is that 99.5% of us have a change in our DNA, and if we receive that medicine, it may not work or it may cause us harm. Um, and it turns out that 25% of you, including me, uh, will have at least four of these. So that's four drugs that may, or four medicines that might routinely be prescribed to you over your life course that perhaps you should avoid. Um, and so we are now working with the NHS to bring this type of testing live. I mentioned earlier that we needed to do research on this and investigate more because there were lots of uncertainties when we started. So eventually we assembled a coalition of intellects from, three, of, from 33 countries, that's 3,580 people, uh, 413 academic institutions. By the way, this worked out pretty well for them because actually it turns out that my team did most of the work, prepared all the data, and then we just gave it to them and they got on with it. So they managed to raise over 50 million pounds in grants, which is pretty good going. And they had um, something like a 50%, 43% uh, grant success rate. Some people in this room would die for that success rate. Uh, but um, th these guys were very successful. And it was because what we did was democratically allow access to anybody from a bona fide institution. We, and you can see here in blue, 
This is the places in the world that they come from. So you'll see that we've got a big gap in America, uh, the Arabian Peninsula, somewhat in India and uh, Latin America or South America. We also had a discovery forum of companies. So we tried to get the latest technologies, the latest advances for the patients. And uh, some of those have helped accelerate uh, the technologies that are used for this now. So what did we do with this? And probably uh, you won't know this, but um, <clears throat> although it was hoped that this project would change the entire NHS and a genomic medicine service, so this is the big ticket item, how did it change things? Um, uh, we didn't expect to achieve this, and that was particularly hard work. But in partnership with Sue Hill, um, we set about designing a new NHS genomic medicine service. And the reason that I was very keen we did that is because before we started, depending on where you lived, your postcode, you could get a really good set of tests or you could get no tests whatsoever. That can't be right. We have to have equity of access to genomic testing. So that's what this is designed to do. So we created seven laboratory hubs. Previously, we had about 20 labs in England. So we uh, condensed it to seven major centers. And then we developed a national test directory. This was the hard part, actually, um, because normally when the NHS com commissions a service, they, they state that they want the service to run for three to five years. But this is such a dynamic area that would not have worked. So I insisted that we have an annual test directory review. They've never agreed to that in commissioning before. And I, I don't think they really knew what I was letting them in for because it, it means that there will be more whole genomes and more genetic tests available for people on an annual basis. So it's quite different to other healthcare. And then what we do is we offer everyone the opportunity who has a whole genome or genomic test to be in the UK Genomic Knowledge Base, a national genomic library for research. So what we're going to do is continue to enrich that uh, uh, resource so that we can be better at diagnosing, better at understanding how to use this, and we can make the NHS into a learning ecosystem where we're doing research cheek by jowl with the patient, and therefore being able to short circuit the loop to get more information back that will inform the clinical care and outcome for that person. There are also genomic medicine service alliances. These are relationships with the NHS. They're where the clinics are, they're where the patients are, they're hospitals like the Royal London over there, and we have a workforce development program. And uh, as a result of this, uh, before I left Genomics England, I signed a contract uh, with a sequencing entity, which further reduced the price of whole genome sequencing. And there are half a million whole genomes available from the NHS uh, over the next five to seven years. So um, uh, that's, that system is now going and operational uh, and involving patients. So then the pandemic arose. And we decided we needed to be um, more useful than we uh, might be if we just all uh, did Teams and Zoom calls all day uh, for at least two years. Uh, so we started a COVID program and we buddied up with a study that already existed called Genetics in Mortality uh, in Critical Care. Rather a mouthful, don't worry about it. These were people with severe COVID-19 who were essentially in ITU. And... Um, in our first paper in Nature, we, we published that we found some regions of your and my genetic code that make you more likely to be in ITU. And what that did is that information added to other information that we had, encouraged the recovery trial to adopt a drug called baricetinib, which is a sort of anti-inflammatory medicine. And in February 2022, they published that baricetinib, with, in addition to other medicines, reduce mortality by 13%. So that's the genome telling us where the medicines are that we need to use, homing us in. We'd never have found that without this technology. However, there was good evidence for baricetinib potentially being considered. So I don't say that the genome was a slam dunk. It did lever it over the edge, but there was other collateral evidence for it. Now, we've more recently whole genome sequenced 7,500. In fact, we're now, uh, I think we're at 14,000 versus 14,500. Um, and we found 23 regions of your and my genetic code that make you more susceptible. These are, don't want to get technical, but these are in inflammatory genes or immuno immune system genes. Some are blood group genes, and one is a clotting gene. Now, you may have heard that in COVID, some people got clots. We think we found the reason. 
there is a variant near uh, one of the clotting factors uh, which may be relevant. So uh, in 2018, um, the, so in 2016, there was a CMO's report called Generation Genome. So we're all in Generation Genome. I'm a bit on the way out of Generation Genome, I think, but there we are. But you're all in it. And um, uh, the chief medical officer, again, Dame Sally, wrote to me and said, um, I'm a bit worried about some of the recommendations in this report. I think they're too conservative. Could you take a look at it? And so uh, what we did was to look at how a genome could be used in a child. So what, what we did, the first thing was to look at the evidence of children who go into intensive care, either immediately after birth or as children. And now, today, there is a service sequencing the genome in Exeter that does rapid sequencing and feeds results back. And their diagnostic yield is between 42 and 44%. So these are children with unexplained admission to ITU. We don't know what's wrong with them. We can't work it out. Conventional tests don't tell us. We know there's something major wrong. And what this does is it means that where we can make this work Mums and dads do not have to go through months of testing. They can get an answer more quickly. And we can turn this round in a few days and get you the result back. And what it does is prioritise care. Sometimes there is a treatment. Sometimes it changes the uh, outcome to one that's palliative. But because you can answer mum and dad's questions about why their child is like this, there is a greater acceptance that that is the right way to go. When you can't answer a mum or dad, questions they don't want to let go because they have that uncertainty that things might all turn out all right. So this is again about giving information that inform choices. So that service is now live. That was the first thing we recommended. Then we looked at what else could you do with a genome. And let's imagine that the genome is something you measure at a certain point in life, could be just after birth. And it's there and it's your genome. And, and your and my genome does change over life, but not hugely. So Maybe you could use this as a life course resource to tell you about ill health. But we lit upon when would you analyze it in early life. Um, and as a result of that, the um, government funded in um, uh, 2021 uh, 100,000 newborn children being sequenced in uh, the UK, across the UK, all through the UK this time. I managed to get away from that madness about England only. Um, and what the, uh, it turns out is if you look at, um, rather than this being an open-ended thing in which you scare people, because information from your and my genetic code can be uh, worrying to people, especially if you say, we found this thing, but there's absolutely nothing we can do about it. So the important thing is to be able to link this to an answer. So what we've focused in on is um, disorders that are treatable. So there's a clear treatment. Uh, often they're not expensive. So only 8% of these disorders have a treatment that costs a lot of money. And uh, what we found is that one in 190 live births in the UK and in 2019, which was the last normal year, there were 712,000 live births. That's uh, if one in 190, that's 3,750 children born every year with a treatable genetic disease. Which, what if we could detect that immediately after birth? Because sometimes children are born uh, well and okay, and then uh, after a period of time, they start to get unwell. And if you let them get unwell, and you don't intervene to try and attenuate it or stop it, then they may get fixed changes that you can't reverse. Most of the treatments are diets, vitamins, uh, and only 8% are expensive things, expensive medicines or transplants of one sort or another. And I've also put it there, uh, so that's 10 children born every day some, somewhere in the UK. So that program has been piloting and we've just been selected here at Queen Mary and Bart's Health to be a major site for enrolment. And that's very important for us because we're very committed to our local community, which is very diverse around here. And often for various reasons, they have enhanced rates of rare disease. So we did some economics on this because as you'll imagine, um, sequencing 100,000 people is not uh, cheap. Uh, but actually, if you were able to reverse these disorders, you release between 360,000 pounds and 1.4 million in care over um, a first few years in life. And the children will gain between 16.8 and 40.3 life years gained. Now, some of you who think about adult disease will say, 
that's a lot of life years gained. Yeah, but they're children, they're just born. So you're, you are able to get by them time potentially. And the newborn uh, study is examining that. But of course, one of the things I should have said at the outset was that um, we involve participants throughout this program. And so whenever we were doing something new, we assemble the participants. This is a new thing we did with the participants. This is the strategy called Genome UK, the future of healthcare, which is the government strategy. It's not my strategy. I wrote bits of it, but it's not mine. And it was launched by the Minister for Health, uh, Lord Bethel. Um, and what that does is uh, essentially make the government commit to the use of this in diagnosis and precision healthcare, prevention and in research, and they followed through um, on that. So when we were constructing the newborn program, we thought the most important thing to do was to ask people like you, what did you think of it? So we assembled people randomly chosen from the population to be representative of the demographic of the United Kingdom and its diverse communities. And we asked them, what do you think of this idea? And they were actually very positive, in th very enthusiastic, um, more enthusiastic than I expected them to. And by the way, much more enthusiastic than their clinicians were about this project. That probably won't surprise some of you who are clinicians. So they felt that this could be a seismic shift uh, what we had to do was to make sure it was representative, it was conducted in a range of health settings, not just centres of excellence like this one, and reach the population. So that's what they told us, and that's what they've done. Because we involved lots of patients in the public, we have a lot of information from them about what they think about this. And it's really, really important when you're in medicine to stop and ask the people who are affected by what you're doing, what do they think of it? And actually, you get a range of answers which are hugely informative. So number one, um, people in the program are much keener to share their data than the researchers think they would be. They're far keener. They say, well, why would I not share my data? I'm I might get an answer from it. So we asked them, what should the NHS do in its social contract around genomics? And a representative group commented that we should, be re we should have reciprocity, so we should turn up, we should contribute, we should be altruistic, we should have solidarity with each other. We should enter things because we don't expect to benefit, but because we might benefit others, rather than entering only because it might benefit me. Of course it might benefit you, but it may not always. What did they say with the red lines? They said the red lines were gene editing. Uh, they were not keen on that. Um, I think that may change in time. Um, interestingly, commercial uses for healthcare. So um, they were absolutely fine with companies that make medicines or tests working on the data, but they were not fine with their data being used for marketing. So they did not want to find that their data was on a television advert in America saying six out of 10 people with this rare disease are cured if they have this treatment. They didn't want that. They really didn't want it. And finally, and this is very important, and I, I urge anyone doing these programs to avoid this pitfall, no surveillance society. So in the 100,000 Genomes Project and in the Genomic Medicine Service, it is unacceptable use for law enforcement authorities to request the genome and uh, use it for forensic or other purposes. Because what will happen if you do that is that large swathes of the communities that should engage, diverse representative communities, will not engage in the research because they're concerned about how it might be used. And because of stories from America and how genomic databases have been used, uh, people are suspicious of this already. And you, can, you won't have to look very far on social media to find that the people are worried about this. So we banned it. Now, the, can the police get hold of the genomes? Yes, but they have to go to the high court. So they'd be very brave if they did that. Um, so um, finally, um, we actually also asked uh, 1,866 people, and this was in 2019, a representative group, what they wanted from a genome. And this was when um, our previous uh, health secretary, Matt Hancock, was around, and he wanted to offer a for sale uh, whole genome service from the NHS. I was a bit unkeen on that, if I'm honest. I don't think that's what the NHS should do. But anyway, 72% um, uh, said they were interested in how their genetic makeup might interact with a drug. 71% um, wanted to know about the current medical conditions, 68% health risks in later life. And as many people are, and are already doing this through commercial tests, 67 wanted to know their ancestry. So, um, 
if you put the public and the patients at the heart of any project you do, those people, when they understand what you're doing, not always, but in my experience, if you make the effort to make it accessible and you open the doors to that, they will become hugely interested in what you're doing and actually help you shape it. And so we've, throughout the 100,000 Genomes Project, we asked the participants, what do you want from us? And they were quite, participant panel is, you know, I don't turn up there or didn't turn up there because I don't go anymore. But when I didn't turn up there and, you know, it was a walk in the park, it was not. They were very, very direct about what they wanted to see. And it empowers people. There's another facet about this. At the end of the day, this was taxpayers' money. And those participants, like you all in this room, probably most of you, are taxpayers. And why shouldn't you have a say in how the money is spent to, for healthcare gain? So I've left Genomics England now, but as part of Genomics UK, there is a newborn program that's just starting. That will deliberately enrol from diverse communities and offer the opportunity to people uh, who might be at greater risk of rare disease so that we can actually uh, get them the help they need. And we're also going to continue, or they're going to continue, work on cancer. So, ladies and gentlemen, to finish up, the National Health Service is creating a National Genomic Medicine Service which for the first time will have equitable access to genomic tests across 56 million people and Scotland, Northern Ireland and Wales will join in. It's standardised so you can get the same test anywhere in the UK, that wasn't the case, and it delivers uh, against an approved national test directory. So as a health provider you do not get paid if you don't use the tests in the test directory. So it's in your interest to follow the test directory. And everyone is offered, uh, particularly with a whole genome, a standardized genomic consent. And I can tell you there's over 10,000 whole genomes that have been se sequenced from direct healthcare, And over 96% of the participants have agreed to participate in research. So this is where the NHS from routine care is gathering information that comes available for researchers. And we're building a single UK knowledge base, de-identified, so we remove your identifiers so with others we can share it with. Uh, the future, of course, is a global coalition of intellects driving genomics into healthcare, and, and that's the UK is at the heart of that and ahead, the first health system to have whole genome sequencing. And um, finally, to thank, there's lots of people to thank, the NHS, all our universities, my team at Genomics England, uh, many of whom are great friends now, and most importantly, these people. They're the most important people in this room right now. It's not me and it's not you. These are the participants. And they want to see you because they hope that some of you in the future, if you're not involved in science, will get involved in science and come along and use this data publicly available, democratically accessible. And many of them haven't got answers yet, but they're hoping you will come along and find those answers. So your mission, should you decide to accept, is to become a scientist urgently. And then once you're a scientist, go and work on this. I should thank some other people, all the people who were involved in the New England Journal paper, this could go on forever, Fran. I think we should stop this. But if you do want to get in touch and ask any questions outside of this evening or something occurs to you uh, tomorrow morning, just drop me a line. I'll try and answer it. Thank you for having me. It's been an honor. <laughs>